but uh, from a utilitarian perspective, uh, isn't there a need to set constraints on the actions of self-seeking agents in order to encourage, if not indeed to force them, to pursue actions that are in keeping with the interest of the community? In other words, the, it, is, it is the rationale of public governance to impose a set of rules, call them laws, call them moral responsibilities or what not. They are constraints set by the public sector on individuals. I, I think the essence is the, isn't the setting up of sanctions to constrain individual behavior the main rationale for public governance. Yes, and that's, in fact, uh, as early as Adam Smith. Adam Smith never spoke of laissez-faire as if the government did not, did not exist. He said the foundation of uh, the market society is actually the efficient administration of justice, national defense, and the provision of uh, public works. Uh, so, Nick, I, uh, that is true, uh, that uh, the government exists actually to set uh, uh, constraints on the behavior of individuals to the extent that these possible behaviors may affect other people. So, uh, my point during the talk was that uh, it need not be more than that. Part of the university's role is to constantly re-examine exactly where policy is headed and to cut off those parts which intervene unduly, and, that, and the word is unduly, into the behavior of, uh, of individuals. But certainly, for example, with respect to the uh, organization of markets, the regulation of monopolies, the provision of... Uh, uh, public goods. These are uh, interventions by the government through rules which may affect individual behavior, in fact even constrain it, but they are perfectly justifiable in the sense that they are in the public sphere. They do have a public, a public impact. We'll take the last question from UP Diliman. Yes, please, the gentleman. I'm Ernesto Spadilla, a private citizen in the private sphere. Uh, uh, first, uh, sir, thank you very much for a, an enlightening lecture. I would like only to first, to uh, I beg to defer to your statement about UST at least. In its ecclesiastical education, I think, uh, I think nothing compares to it as far as the ecclesiastical education that it has provided through the years. But my question right now is, I think, um, I, I'm not worried about the fate of uh, secular morality. It has been there, and it will always be there. The only problem, I think, is uh, what would compete with the motivation which is provided, let's say, by a religious morality, where there are good and also bad versions of religious morality, as there are good and bad versions of secular morality. For instance, you have a religion which promises eternal life for living up to its good version of morality, well and good. But how can you do that, for instance, in, the, in a secular form of morality? How can you expect people to live up to the good version of a secular morality if you have very big institutions, for, in, for a little country like the Philippines, you have a very big Congress, you have a big armed forces, and how can there be strict sanctions which can be applied regularly in order to sanction these bad eggs when it's easy to hide in very big institutions? Thank you, sir. I think the important question that you raise is uh, religious morality has the advantage that you can be enthusiastic about it. But can anybody be enthusiastic about secular morality enough so that it becomes self-enforcing? Uh, that's, that's actually a difficult question. The way I've stated it is that we're, we in the university are really fulfilling a negative role. I mean, uh, 
a role where we constantly examine what what uh, government is doing, what people are doing, and tell them, well, you know, that part, that's your, that's your sphere. But don't include it in the public sphere. You can be enthusiastic about your own beliefs. You can be very devout in your own religion. But there are just certain things where you must respect the differences in society, and therefore you should not intervene in that. It's okay for you to persuade, but you should not do it using the government. That, 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 that is basically the role that uh, we are foreseeing uh, in, this, uh, in this talk. Uh, but your question is, uh, uh, how does that become implemented? Ultimately, I think uh, there must be a, uh, an appreciation. This is the difficult part. An appreciation by Filipinos, by members of society, that society itself is worth preserving. Because if you do not have that, then you would not think it important to have a separate set of rules just for society's diversity uh, as well as unity to be, to be preserved. Rather, you would identify yourself merely in terms of uh, the religion or the organization or the specific profession that you belong to without evaluation of what society uh, as a whole is. And, and that's an elusive uh, quest for something like a state university, which is built on that foundation that there is such a thing as Philippine society, there is such a thing as the Philippine nation, and that it's worth viewing it as a collective, separately from the divisions that uh, may uh, part one sector of that society from another, which is the reason that you ought to have a separate set of rules governing that society. In the same way that uh, you may have a set of rules uh, when you're in your household, but when you enter an organization, you submit yourselves to the uh, supervening rules of that, of that organization. Is there something like that for Philippine society? Or is it the case that uh, when you look at it, nothing seems to inspire you and therefore you do not feel the need to conform to or even to improve upon the rules that govern it. You withdraw instead into a tribe, which is the church, which is your organization, your family. So that's the entire question of whether uh, Philippine society and the Philippine nation can cohere or not. On behalf of the Centennial Lecture Series Committee, we thank our lecturer for the insightful view that he shared with us this afternoon. Thank you, Professor De Dios. Thank you. At this point, may I request President Emerlinda Roman to present the certificate for the Centennial Fellow Award to Professor Emmanuel De Dios. <laughs>